and you know he doesn't have to ask me twice. Um, I loved I loved my time in Maine. I loved my time at at Bates. I, I sort of love my time at Bowdoin, and uh, um, it's it's good to it's good to be back in Maine if we can say that. So uh, so what I did was. Uh, I, I looked at some offensive line play stuff, and, and this is more run focused. I can talk about pass stuff if you guys want to, but this is kind of uh, basically run focused stuff, but it's essential offensive line play. So I don't know if you guys ever saw this, right? Les Mon they're in hot water at Kansas, right? Look at his call sheet. Look at the call sheet. He's asking the assistant, look at the call sheet. This is the undisciplined pursuit of more. All right, this is just us as football coaches creating these giant call sheets, you know, where we, we can't find stuff, you know, and, and I'm as guilty as anyone. If you're an offensive guy, you, 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 you write down too much stuff and you get involved in too many plays and you got too much stuff and then you end up with a giant, uh, giant sheets, double-sided and uh, bound and all that other stuff. I, I think that, you know, this was a book that actually Tim Vile turned me on to uh, called Essentialism by Greg McCown. Um, it, essentialism is defined as the, the disciplined pursuit of less. And so this is the hardest thing I think as an offensive coach uh, to do is to be really disciplined into uh, what we're going to teach, how we're going to teach it, how much we're going to carry um, and how it all fits, it fits together so that ultimately the, the kids can perform, right? It's, it's all about the player's performance. So, um, so here's just some general thoughts, right? So I think most of the guys that were on know me and I know them, um, you know, I've been coaching for 28 years, um, which is just less than half the time that Skip's been coaching. Um, uh, 18 of that has been as a head coach. Um, 27 years of that was college football. I've only coached high school football one year, and that was this past season. And it really uh, forced me to really think and adapt. I, I gained a new appreciation for uh, – I always knew that the high school coaches were, were awesome and worked really hard, but I didn't realize how hard. Um, it's a lot. And so uh, it forced me to adapt and kind of adapt the things that I do. And um, it's pretty good. Um, you know, I, I wanted to put this in there because I get a kick out of this. You know, people say, trust the process. I mean, whose process are you going to trust, right? And, uh, you know, I'm friends with a guy named Tony Holler, who's a, who's a track and football guy uh, out in the Midwest. If anyone's done the track and football consortium stuff, it's awesome. It'll make you rethink how you're coaching. But he always talks about whose process are you following. It's easy to follow, like, hey, this is Alabama's process, or this is Ohio State's process. This is Urban Meyer's process. Yeah, well, they, they've got different groceries than you, right? So my friend Brad Dixon out there in Illinois says, everybody wants the recipe, but nobody knows how to cook. Um, I think you got to learn how to cook because everyone's groceries are different, right? The, the ability for us to be successful, we cannot follow the blueprint. We cannot follow what Belichick's doing. We have to figure out what's going to work with us. We have to figure out how to cook with our own groceries. So, um, you know, so I kind of, this was kind of what I evolved to is this do less, achieve more. And, and, this, to me, the, the matches kind of represent a typical practice week for how we coach football for years and years and years, right? We'd start out nice and fresh at the beginning of the week, and then we'd burn them up. And then by the time we get to game day, we're worn out. You know, I, I remember going through full contact football practice on a Thursday night before a Friday game. And, um, you know, and we were all hitting too much. We're all doing all this other stuff because we think that's how it's supposed to be done. But all of a sudden, when you have 35 players – you cannot do that. Um, you'll get to that end match faster than anything, and you got to learn how to how to kind of do what's essential. So practice. My my thing is practice should resemble performance, and performance should resemble practice. Um, and if it doesn't look like football, get rid of it. You know, any kind of drill that you know doesn't resemble what they're going to do as a football player, get rid of it. It it has no place in there. It'll just waste time and it'll wear the kids down. Um, so I, I started kind of thinking about non-negotiables, right? So there's an old dog learning new tricks. Um, I named that dog uh, Capone uh, for, for obvious reasons. Taking a lot of shots at Skip tonight. Um, what determines your non-negotiables? So number one is, is how much time do you have to teach it, um, the ability of your players, uh, the system that you want to run, and then ultimately you, how, how you can coach it, how good you are at coaching it and, and, and getting the kids to understand it. So that's what's going to determine non-negotiables. Um, so to me, I kind of boiled it back and I, I boiled it all down. And I said, I only get so much time with the offensive linemen. What am I going to teach these guys that's going to allow me to run my offense, right? And I'm a gap scheme guy, so this is going to be gap scheme dependent. If you're a zone scheme guy, you might want to, you'd replace some of these things with maybe zone pods and that kind of stuff would be kind of an essential thing for you. But for me, these are kind of the techniques 
that I thought that if I can teach these to the offensive line and get them really good at them, then we can put it into our system and we can make the ball go. Okay. So these are my run blocking non-negotiables. Okay. So uh, the first thing I'm going to share with you is, uh, you know, you, you can see it in there. You got the strain drill, which is kind of like when you drive blocking a relentless reach, which is how I teach the reach block, which is maybe a little bit different. Attack pulling is to kick out. Skip pulling is to pull through. And then the high leg cross shove is, is the essential part of how we double team combining that with the strain drill. So you'll see kind of how it fits together. And if you can picture the, the power play in your mind um, or, the count, or the gap plays in your mind, you'll see how kind of it fits together. So uh, first thing I want to show you is this. This is kind of neat. Um, it's uh, an angled boxing punch pad. So this is a jab bag that a, punch, that a boxer would use. It's kind of like those LaCharles Bentley balls. But they're, but they're really, they're smaller, it weighs less than three pounds, but it'll take a beating. I used it at, I used it at Bowdoin. I used them here. They take a beating. They're pretty good. Um, they're smaller, so they got to have smaller hand things, but they're still round, so they're kind of hitting something that they got to really strike it. Um, it's hard to grab, so they got to use their hands in the correct way. Um, but it's a really neat piece of equipment. It's only 50 bucks, and uh, I bought four of them, and I use them for a bunch of different stuff. The guys can run around with them. They can throw them to each other. It's great stuff. Hey, Bob. Um, all right, so this is kind of where I start. Um, the strain drill I got a long time ago from the Air Force Academy, and it's kind of how I start every week. Like, if, if you played offensive line for me at any point in time, they, they still ask me. I had a guy ask me this week, do you still do the strain drill? I do the strain drill all the time. Um, and, and I think it's a great drill because it, it creates um, – it creates that point of contact. Like we all do the board drills and we're hitting bags down a board and we're driving them and, and they're light and it's, it's easy. Um, the strain drill kind of puts that hard part of blocking into, into blocking um, where you have to create uh, force. You have to, you have to push. Um, you got to use your legs. Uh, it, it's a great drill. And so the way that I progress the strain, so I actually have three different drills here of the same drill. So this is an Idaho uh, vandals doing the doing the drill, but they're doing it from a locked up position. So this would be a great way to start. And uh, it's using uh, three different pieces of equipment. This is a long bag, like an agile bag or a blocking shield, with two guys holding the bag and one guy uh, straining to block it. So I'll show you guys. I'll just I'll just play this, um, and you can just see we're just pushing. He's pushing out of a shoot. You get a back shot here. It's pretty good. He's linked in. He's going to foot fire, and then on the command, he's going to push. And so his partners are resisting there um, to give him something to push against. He should still win. We don't want to have a total stalemate, but we want to have him try to break the stalemate by, by pushing with his hips and his legs. So that's tied up in just kind of a, a fit position strain. Then kind of moving to the next part of it, this is uh, Kaiser University. That's Roy Isvan. Uh, you guys might know Roy's with the Eagles now. But this is down at Kaiser, and he's doing it. Uh, you know, with the bags kind of close to the guy. So now he's going to have to come out of a stance, strike the bags, and then strain. Um, and so they're doing it with two hand shields here. Uh, you can see how the hand placement, but it's, it's the idea that it's a two-on-one drill where you guys are having to create force, having to use their hips, trying to have them use their legs, get all their cleats in the ground, and really push the bag hard. Um, so here he is, and he's just, boom, firing out, wide base, you know, toes ducked out, drive, 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 and trying to really strain their body. I don't want them to totally roll their hips on this. I want to keep some strain in it. That's why we call it the strain drill. And so they're really kind of working on that, that pivotal part of the block where we're trying to break the stalemate. All right, and then this was just – this was a couple of weeks ago before coronavirus hit, and uh, I was just asking the guys to film a couple of things. And now this is a, this is a two-on-one strain. Um, this kid is new at it. Um, but what I've done here is I've moved the bag back. So it's kind of at the end of a board or end of an agile bag that we're using here just kind of for feet separation. And I want him to kind of get four steps in so he's having to kind of fire out, stay low, and strike, and then kind of work it through. And I use one bag and tell one guy to put his shoulder pad, the inside shoulder, onto the bag, and we're going to dig in there. Now that's my, one of my running backs and my tight end working against this 300-pound this, uh, tackle uh, that's only a sophomore, he's going to be a pretty good player. So here he's getting set. He's just going to fire out. He spins his, spins his hands out there a little bit. But you can see he's kind of getting in there, so he's got to hit it. They could give him a little bit more resistance. Uh, but you get the side shot here too um, where, you know, he's further off the board. 
and they're going to drive that. And so we want to kind of have that so that they're straining. I would probably even have him, them dig him in and make him kind of work to the, to the hash. But the strain drill is kind of how we start. Now with that, we can use that to, um, we can use that to drill our drive blocks. We can use that to drill our drive blocks on an angle. Um, anything where we're having to, we're having to push, um, that becomes a really good drill. And it's something that is a non-negotiable for me. I want the guys doing that. And every day that I have offensive time with them, I'm going to spend, I'm going to spend about five minutes. I tell them it's strain drill. They get into pods of three and we just get off the ball and we go hit that bag. And there's something about it. It's, it's, it's kind of like the, it's kind of like having a sled, but you can kind of do it quickly. You don't have to get reset a whole lot. Um, and it's competitive. The guys will, will kind of get in and get after it. So that's one of my non-negotiables. Um, like I said, I'll go fast through these, and we can go back, and I'll answer all the questions with any kind of individual blocks you want to go through. Um, I call our reach block a relentless reach. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's where we're going to really sell out to, to, to circle the defense. So for me, a relentless reach is used to, to, to circle the, de the defender or the defense. We use it on our outside sweep plays. So on a jet sweep, on a rocket sweep, um, you know, if you're tossing the ball, you know, where you're definitively really trying to get off. I would not use this on a mid-zone play. Um, you know, to me, I either run inside or run outside. I don't know what that mid is. I haven't figured that out, right? I run inside or I run outside. So this is for an outside play. Um, I teach an arc step, um, which is not a bucket step. Uh, the arc step, and I'll, I got a video of it, um, is a greater than parallel step where we're stepping deep and open to get our hips and shoulders open to the sideline. I've coached the reach block a thousand ways. This is the easiest way I've ever done it. The guys get it. You use it on the front side and the back side. It's pretty simple. Uh, when we're ready to block the guy, we shoot and grab the V of the defender's shoulder pad with our backside or a forearm. You might hear it as a drag arm, but we want to keep the play side near arm free. All right, so we want to kind of get into the position that we're getting here, which I have is long and strong. That's Drew Chamberlain of, of, uh, of Maine. Right there, Falmouth, uh, great kid. Um, and, and he's getting in there and he's kind of showing that position from his back foot uh, to, to, that, to his arm. They're really kind of long and strong through that. It's a very strong position. Um, and, and he can hold the defender off with one arm. Uh, and as we reach him, we're going to lean into the defender and we're going to press him vertical so that as we're working toward the sideline horizontally, we're still working up the field. And at the end of the day, if we ran out of bounds, we would gain ground. Um, there's ways to finish the block and I can talk to you about that. But in general, we kind of get to this position and you're just running with the guy, um, playing long, playing strong. One arm is longer than two. It's almost like a long, long arm stick move by a defensive player. Um, so it's good stuff. It's good stuff. So, so here's the handle. This is what I refer to as the handle. I'm a, I'm an offensive line guy. Everything's a handle. Everything's a steering wheel. You're supposed to grab, but you can see Wendell there grabbing JJ Watt right on the handle. Uh, and that's where, that's where we want to be. So our eyes will go to the outside bicep, but we're going to shoot our backside hand to the V of the shoulder pad, trying to get play side number part of the shoulder pad and hook our hand right in there. All right, so when we start out doing this, we teach the guys how to find the brace. So that's, that's uh, Scott Peters. He does some great stuff with the tip of the spear, and this is one of the things that I kind of learned from him um, was finding the brace. And so all we're going to have the guys do is kind of get into position where the offensive player is the, is the guy in the red shoes here. And he's going to find that brace, and he's going to have the defender lean into him so we can really kind of find the strongest position. All right, so once the guys learn, they just kind of do that on their own. We'll kind of work with them to get them into the right spot to find the brace. And then we're going to run to reach. So this was at Bowden uh, with the tight ends in the offensive line, and we're working to get them into positions to find the brace so they can run to reach. So – you can see Tim, that's Tim Vile right there. He's resetting the tight end's foot to get him in the right spot. Really, the, uh, the offensive lineman over here is in a better spot. And then they're just going to run to reach. And this is a great drill. Um, the guys get competitive with it. But we're just trying to outdistance the defender. The defender's running to get across the, into the end zone. Offensive players look to push him off. And you can see kind of where 75 ends up is kind of what we want to do on that drill. Find the brace and then run to reach. Then as you progress to the next part, you got to teach them how to arc step. So here's, uh, here's the arc step. So essentially, what I told you is, I don't, I don't want it to be a bucket step. I want it to gain ground. So you can kind of see, he's going to gain ground to the call side, but he's opening his hips to the sideline. You know, he's not totally, you know, facing the sideline, but he's getting into a position where he can shoot that hand and find the handle. 
So that's a really good example there. I'll play it again for you of our guy getting to that, that spot where he's stepping over and out and back just so that he can get the second foot through the crotch of the defender and shoot his hands to the V of the neck. All right, and again, I think this is an essential block for us because we use it on the front part and we use it on the back side of zone. So here it is, you put it all together, right? So what I did was we didn't have shoulder pads at this point. Um, we're just using a hand, a hand shield here. I want them to, to grab the top of the hand shield like it's the handle, all right? But they're gonna work at it through their stance, uh, from their stance. So this is just putting the whole thing together. And I tried to, you know, moving them out there. I want them to make it challenging for the guy. I want them to make it challenging for the guy because it's going to be pretty easy. Um, and the defender's not really reacting so much to the block as much as he's kind of uh, helping them out by he's going to let them get to him, and then he's going to really uh, – they're going to work the run to reach. And you can see, so he's just working on really sticking it there so he can stab the bag. Um, I'm showing incredible athleticism of chasing 72 here. Um, but you can see it's a, good, it's a good example of the drill, and it just kind of gets the guys the idea of, of running to reach and then that time where they're going to stab it. And it's, is it a three-step? Is it a five-step? Is it a seven-step? It's as many as you need to get there. Um, but in general, 72 here is doing a good job on his first step, and he gets there. That's kind of how we put it together so that we can do that. Now, um, you know, again, I, I picked this up from a bunch of places. Here's Notre Dame. Um, I thought this was pretty good. I was just kind of showing, like, you know, two guys working together to make the drill work of kind of getting to that position with that inside hand. I'll skip over that. All right. Uh, again, I still film from everywhere I can. So this is Ali Marpet. Uh, he played at Hobart. I actually coached against him when I was the head coach at Endicott. And he's playing center here. And this is a great example of the center using that technique where he's going to get to that point where that drag hand, he sticks him in the neck. The guy can't get back underneath and then he can, he can slow down and finish him. Uh, so a good picture of kind of working at the highest levels, right? But then you can kind of go back down to, to something that's more similar. I mean, here's – this is at Endicott College about 1,000 years ago. Sean Gaffney, he kicks down doors for uh, Engine 6 in Worcester, Massachusetts uh, as a firefighter. Um, maybe one of the best guys that I ever, uh, I ever coached. But watch, watch him here get to that what I call a pillar, right? He gets his arm fully extended to reach the DN and then work up to the Mike linebacker because that's his responsibility here. So let's see, let's see if we can get this one to go. So you can see Sean here, he's going to open up and go. His first step's not great, but the technique he uses is pretty good. Gets out there, long arm, work to the backer, go down to cut the backer. Um, you get the idea. This is uh, Tufts uh, University against Wesleyan. Um, they use a similar technique. So I kind of had here, his first step's not great, but you can kind of see him get to the position that they would wanna, want him to get to with a, with a reach like this. Let's see here, uh, slow motion. Yeah, so his first step's not great, but he gets there, outside arm is free, and he's pressing it off. Uh, so hopefully the back can get around and, and get to the outside. Uh, and again, like, I love showing the guys the pro stuff because they love to see it. But I mean, Kelsey's about as good as there is. I mean, that's, that's kind of textbook right there. I mean, you really don't get better than that. And then here's a guard kind of executing, same, same type of technique, watch his feet. To get there, he's got the outside arm involved, but you can see he's bracing that inside arm down and keeps him on, keeps him going. So those are some of the things on the reach block. Again, if you got questions, just jump in and ask or hold them to the end. I'll, I'm just trying to go fast so we get everything in, so we can have lots of time for questions. Now we use it also as a backside cutoff. So, so here's, so here's the pros, right? So you look at the pros, and again, I, I find stuff from all over the place. Open the hip, head placement, backside hand cuts him off, bang. Backside hand acts as a lever, working through, stealing off the backside. Okay, so yeah, great. That's, that's the pros. Well, here's, here's Bowdoin College, my first year there. This kid is really bright. He's going to be a doctor, but he, was, he wasn't a great football player. He wasn't real strong, but he was pretty good at technique. Watch him here. He, uh, he's got a great first step. He gets it in there, sticks out the arm. He holds off that, guy, that kid that's a little bit better a football player than him. So technique kind of works to cut off that, that two-eye defensive tackle. So use it on the front side, using it on the back side. But it's, a, it's a kind of a critical block, a non-negotiable for me that everybody learns how to uh, relentlessly reach that guy. Now, my favorite stuff in the world is, is guard, guard pull or, or you know, uh, this kind of stuff. So a kick-out block for me is an attack pull. And uh, 
Um, I think this is a key block at all levels of football, um, and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of good coaching to it. Um, we use this when we're kicking out a defender. I don't believe, and you guys have probably heard me say this before if you've heard me speak before, I don't believe in starting a lawnmower. I don't believe in elbowing a, a little person behind me. I don't believe in really ripping that arm open. I believe in flicking the play side wrist. I got that, I got that a long time ago from Mike Foley, and uh, it never, it's never fails to be the best way to teach it. So our, our guards or whoever's pulling to kick out is going to flick the wrist, his play side wrist, and he's going to step and open his hip to the target. It's that simple. Um, it's not a big grandiose move. It's really kind of a quick, um, you know, uh, uh, a quick kind of compact move, I guess is a good way to put it. And it gets us on the right, on the right target. We don't step deep because we want, to, we want the block to occur on the other side of the line of scrimmage if we can. We're going to attack the defender's near shoulder with our correct shoulder. So I'll always say to the guys, the coaching point is, if you pull right, you hit with the right. Uh, pull right, hit with the right shoulder. Pull left, hit left. Pull left, hit with the left shoulder. And this is a shoulder block. This is, we do not block with our hands when we kick out. Um, we're going to block with our shoulders. Um, and, and that was a really good, that's a really good coaching point. The, the thing that I also tell guys is this, is that we want to block the shoulder that's presented to us. So what that means is, you know, if you get a kid that defensive end that just comes up the field and gives you, your, gives you his inside shoulder, well, we're going to take that and we're going to kick it out, um, you know, appropriately. But if you've got a kid that's been well coached and maybe his team is a wrong arm team and he kind of sits into the line of scrimmage and really tries to rip back across your face and, and wrong arm it, we're going to hit him in that backside shoulder. Now that might turn into a log, but we're always going for the kick out. I believe that you go for the kick out, you go for the kick out, you go for the kick out, and then logs kind of naturally happen when you're doing that. And, and I have film of that them naturally happening, but we're talking about kick out blocks. So really getting in there and, and, and kicking it out. I do believe that it's, a sh it's shoulder flipper. So hit with the shoulder, lift with the flipper, and get the feet out of the hole. Here's a great point. I, I, got, this, I got this one just the other day. I was talking to, uh, to uh, Bobby Johnson, who I, I coached against when he was a player, and now he's a, he's a really good young coach. He's working at the University of Albany now as an offensive line coach. And, you know, we both agree that the, the first contact is with the shoulder pad, but to get the guys to, to feel the, that the form is long, I used to say, hit them with your watch, but the kids don't wear watches as much anymore. So, you know, he said, it's like a kettlebell swing. And that kind of painted a really good picture in my mind of, of how, the, how the, the strike should come from the shoulder. And then the hand is inside the feet um, and, and lifting up. Um, and I think if anyone that's ever done a kettlebell swing or seen a kettlebell swing can understand that your hand is not outside your knee, it's inside your knee and it's hitting and lifting. And I think that, that that was a great visual for me and how I'm going to teach it now. I'm giving Bobby all the credit, but it was a great term. Um, and then your pass should take you back across the line of scrimmage. I played in a wing T offense in college for Don Miller, who played wing T, you know, wing T quarterback in the 50s at Delaware, where, you know, the, where it was all born. And he told me all the good, all the good kickoff blocks take you back across to your own side of the line of scrimmage. So this is a picture of it. So we're going to, you can see, we're going to flick the play side wrist and step it open to our target. We're going to attack the defender's near shoulder with our correct shoulder. If the defender wrong arms, we may log him, but we always go for the kick out. And then it's shoulder flipper, get your feet out of the hole. That's another good coaching point. Get your feet out of the hole. Young kids can understand that because when they're going to initially try to attack pull, it's going to be they're just going to try to hit him and they stay in the same spot. And if the guy doesn't just get blown, get his doors blown off, if he actually has something that you're hitting up against and is stout, you're going to have to get your feet out of the hole so the running back doesn't trip over you. So I think that paints a good picture for especially young linemen. Um, and then finish. Your, back, the, your pass should take you back across the line of scrimmage, just running your feet. So here's a drill. Um, got this drill from Stanford. Um, you don't have to have all the bells and whistles, but I've done this drill by taking blocking bags, you know, the big square blocking bags that most of us have in the back of our shed that we might not use anymore. I, I put them together and made uh, a, a crash mat. If you have a crash mat, it's great. I would give the guy getting kicked out a hand shield or something to, I don't want my guys to ever hit each other without a shield in between them just to keep them healthy. But I want that guy to dig in with the hand shield a little bit, um, keeping his feet even because he's going to get knocked over. Um, but giving him something to hit so that he can lean forward and kind of dig in a little bit. And then we would execute the block the same way here where it's just, it's a fun drill for the kids. They're learning how to hit and kind of kettlebell swing 
They knock each other. There's, you got to prepare yourself for a lot of giggling and laughing, but it's a fun drill for the guys and uh, it teaches the skill really, really well. So I really like this. I like, Stan I like Stanford's use of the, the shoot there to get down a little bit lower, but you don't necessarily need that. But you definitely need something for them to land on. Um, so putting all those things together, you take it from the drill and you bring it into, the, bring it into practice. So here's us, at, here's us at practice at Bowdoin. 53 was the best kid I ever had as a kickout guy. In, in my whole time coaching, he was the best one I ever had. Um, and I think primarily because the other thing about an attack pull is it, it's an aggressive block. It's a take a shot block. Um, you can't have any nice in you. You can't pity pat your feet. You got to take a shot and you got to blow things up. And if you got a kid that can do that, make him your puller. Um, we literally ran this play one way. We ran our kickout stuff one way with AJ because he was the best at it. Um, and so you, you'll see us doing that with him. So here, I'll let it play. But you can see, uh, this will play back a few times so you can see it. But watch his feet initially. He's just going to flick his wrist and open his hips. Then he's going to run to contact with his correct shoulder. And then he's going to he's going to shoulder pad, flipper, and lift. And then he's going to run his feet to get out of the hole. Okay, head coach is pretty happy there in the in the uh, in the in the gray. All right. So then you take you take it and you bring it back to you bring it back to being in the game. So Skip, here we are against Bates. This kid was a pretty good player at 89. He was a pretty good player. So uh, this was going to be an earth-shattering kaboom. He wasn't going to go anywhere. We told AJ that this was not going to be an easy kickout like in practice, and he was going to really have to finish that week. So, again, watch the techniques. He's going to flick his wrist and open to the target. So he's not big, grandiose movement here. It's just kind of flicking his wrist a little bit. He's going to run to the target using his shoulder pad first and then his forearm flipper. And he's going to run his feet to get out of the hole, and he's going to finish. I'd say that's a pretty good finish. All right, and it, but it's, it's an attitude block, which is why it's a non-negotiable. You know, we want to have a good attitude and be able to kick guys out. Um, I think when you're having, a trouble, you're having a, tr a trouble drive blocking a guy, I think you kick him out. I think if you can't kick him out, you read him. And that's kind of how we go about taking care of good players. That's pretty good. All right, here's another one. Now, this is against Colby. Um, again, A.J. pulling here. You'll see the same, same techniques, right? Flick the wrist, hit with the shoulder throw the forearm, run your feet. Now that kid was a little light and lighter, a little lighter kid, not as, not as good a player as the Bates kid. So AJ kind of blows him up, knocks him out. Um, but he's going to finish. I always tell him, finish him. Yeah, that might be a little bit of piling on there, but uh, you know, he's wearing pads and, and it's football. So that's good stuff. All right. So the attack pull there. And then this was my favorite attack pull of all time. Um, this is against Middlebury. We, uh, this was a key play in the game. Uh, this got called back for a 15-yard personal foul uh, for excessive blocking. I, I swear to God, that's what the guy told me. He said this was excessive because he took him off the, off the sideline. What, what the official fails to say is that the defensive end from Middlebury actually pulled him, pulled him out of bounds uh, and kind of wrecked it. And so because he's trying to get him off, it was excessive. That play got called back. It would have set the all-time NESCAC single-game rushing record for the kid. I'm still upset about it, but it's such a great play. Um, I'll play it for you one more time because it's just, it's just great seeing a guy take the guy from, out, you know, from you know, halfway to the hash and take him all the way to the sideline. You know, that's getting your feet out of the hole. So that's some stuff on the attack pull. Again, another non-negotiable. Now, if you, if you know me, the skip pull is another big thing. There's a lot of verbiage here. Um, I'll talk you through it so that it's, it's, it's easier to kind of coach through it. But um, here's, here's how we look at it, right? I always say skip, shuffle, spike. Skip, shuffle, spike. I'm not – this is for when we're going to pull through. So this could be a guard on a power play, right? A guard on a power play. And so I used to say, you know, skip and they would run, and then I'd have them shuffle before they were going to go vertical, and it was just too much. So I just started telling them, skip. Get into your shuffle and then spike. Here's the key thing on the skip block, on the skip step. We don't want this foot to cross this foot. We don't want to get, we don't want to get crossed up. So this foot, we tell them screw it into the ground. And on the film, it moves a little bit here, but we want them to screw this foot into the ground. And we want to start the, start the movement by stepping back behind this foot with, our, with the outside leg. So he's going to step back 
And we'd like that foot to land just short of the inside part of this foot. We don't want it to go across. We want it to be a quick one, two, one, and then get this foot in the ground and then start shuffling until you get to your entry point. Okay. That could be here. That could be here. That could be here. It could be way out here. You'll see the different examples. But the key thing is here, we don't want him to get his feet caught up. We want it to get down quick, but this does create a way for us to create a tremendous amount of momentum and speed and cover a lot of distance with, with, uh, with, a, with a, short, a short amount of work. So it's, it's pretty good. So we'll see, uh, we'll see Jake here. Skip, shuffle, shuffle, and he gets up. Now, the spike, this is a better picture of it here. The spike then, you see he's, he's eh, close, right? When he starts his shuffle, the spike is here. So that to me, right there, is when he's gonna get vertical as the spike. Now, like I said, you take as many as you need, all right? But it's skip, shuffle, spike, and get up the field. Now, what this does is, the reason that this is a non-negotiable is it slows him down. And I know like telling the offensive line to slow down is like an oxymoron, right? We're always trying to tell them to speed up, right? But what happens is, a lot of times on the power play, they'll get there too soon right? And they got a phase with their back. This is going to allow them to not only be slow enough, and that sounds weird, right? Slow enough, but it, it'll allow them to be able to stay on track with their linebacker. If you just let them run, sometimes they go, they go and they, uh, they'll go around the linebacker. So like if I just had him run and his linebacker was back in here, he might be way out here and having to kind of make a hard turn, right? You can't turn your shoulders and your hips to the sideline and then expect to get back upfield on a 90 degree turn. Uh, the only places that those work are in the Delaware wing tee, uh, an order of football playbook, and uh, cartoons. Those are the only two places that, that someone can make a 90 degree turn like that, right? These guys can't. So we shuffle them, we spike them, and then they get their hips up the field to, to strike a match on the double team and, and make the play. So, so different ways to coach it. So um, I'm good friends with Herb Hand. Uh, there's a big name drop for you, but Herbie's just an SCAC guy like me, played at Hamilton. Um, we played against each other in college. We've been friends for a long time. And we were, we were talking about skip pulls the other day. And this is what, this is what he kind of was showing me was they do it on the five-man sled. A lot of ways to get – I like this, a way to get a lot of guys some reps. They're not doing a lot of shuffling because he doesn't teach the shuffle. Um, but it kind of shows how you can get five guys involved and, uh, and get a lot of work on this. Now, for me, I would move the guys off the board. I'd move them another man over. So you can see they're kind of one, one or two men over. I'd even go another one over. And I'd put my guys a little wider so that they got a shuffle, get a couple shuffles in, and then get vertical. So I can promise you I got, I'll, I got a new way to work my five-man sled. I'm going to do that, all right? Um, so here, let's put it together. So we've drilled it in practice, kind of running through bags and cones. Um, and now we kind of get into to, uh, practice here. So here's Jake, who was doing the drill before. Uh, Skip, shuffle, 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 spike, get up the field. All right, it's going to run a couple of times for you so you can see it. So that's better on the, on the shuffle step. It doesn't go as far. All right, things kind of tighten up a little bit. Get his foot in the ground, shuffle, two, three, put his foot in the ground, find his linebacker, give us a chance upfield with the back. All right, it's a pretty good picture there of, uh, of uh, practice film. Uh, let's go to this one. So let's say you don't want to take, let's say you're going to run a little fold play here, a little cage play that we call it, right? Against, he was against Colby. So now maybe he's only got to take one. It's as many as you need. He just needs to go A gap to A gap. He might need to just shuffle once. So here's, here's AJ with the skip, shuffle, and then he's going to spike and get up the field. Skip, shuffle, get up the field. Skip, shuffle. There's Noah Nelson, another Mainer. Running a, running a little quarterback draw play. All right, so you don't have to take too many there. All right, let's see AJ again here. So now he's going to be pulling, he's going to, be pulling uh, to, the, to the right here. And you see, he just takes as many as he needs uh, for this to become a successful play. So again, skip, shuffle, 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 spike it, find your linebacker. That's against Amherst. They're a good football team. You know, he's getting a good blow-up block there. All right, now watch how many, how many he needs here because we get some, we get some action by the defense to the left. Uh, they're moving a little bit. They're compressing everything. So Jake finds he has to take a few more. So let's count how many, how many he needs here. But it's all the same technique. Skip, shuffle, 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 find your block. So it's as many as you need. 
you can see it helps him phase with the back or it helps the back phase with him really. And it gets him to a point where the back can really work off his inside hip, which is what we want to get out of our, our gap scheme plays uh, off our puller. We will use this. We'll teach this to our fullbacks and our tight ends too, to use when we're running like the, the counter play where the guard kicks out and the fullback or the tight ends, the puller, they're going to shuffle too. Um, it, it just helps us get through the, through the uh, hole really, really nicely. All right. Next part, and then we can kind of, I think this is the last thing I had before we can kind of go into questions, and I'll stay for as long as Mike wants to stay. Um, but the high leg, um, there's a lot of ways to teach double teams. Um, this, is, this is what I believe. Um, you know, I just think it's something that helps players that aren't overly strong or they're, they're, not, they're not just bruisers. Um, if they are bruisers, it works really, really well. But, you know, I think this works for any kind of kid. Uh, again, it's with the idea of staying square, and it fits into how I double team um, or how I teach the double team. Um, essentially, uh, it's easier to teach it off of, off of film, but what we're going to do is we're going to create, uh, you know, uh, we're going to stay square to the line of scrimmage, but we're working at a 45-degree angle uh, into the crotch of the, of the guy that we're double teaming. So we're stepping to double team uh, with our partner, um, but we're working at a 45 degree angle. I taught this wrong for a long time, guys. I was working laterally and then up. You have to work at the 45. You have to work at an angle that's going to take your inside foot to the crotch of the defender. Um, I think if you're working any other way, it makes it hard. Um, so you're going to cover them up, but you're going to cover them up vertically and horizontally. And it'll make sense when you see it on film. We're, we're aiming uh, through the defender's hip. And we want to use a, a hip shoulder flipper kind of forearm lift. And then we want to shove that defender back and across the face of the, the covered man. So our covered guy is going to be executing a drive block. It's kind of like the strain drill. And then we're going to get some help by hitting the guy in the side. I tell the guys it's like it's a sucker, it's a sucker punch. It's like the guy with a, you know, you're down in the old port and some guy bottles you from the side. That's kind of what it is. It's kind of like one of those things back in the old days when, when Skip Capone ro roamed the old port. Um, so, you know, and then it allows us to keep our eyes up for loopers and linebackers, and it, it kind of helps us find those linebackers that are flowing back over the top. So I'll, I'll show you. Now, this can be done two ways. You can shuffle into it, which is where you're leading with the near foot, or you can skip into it, where you kind of execute a skip technique into the line of scrimmage. Both ways work. Um, the kids will actually, actually figure it out themselves. If you, if you let them have a little bit of, of latitude. So again, these are, I was just teaching to these guys that for the first time here, um, he bounces off a little bit. He's going to shuffle into it or gallop into it at an angle, and he's going to deliver the shot and shove. Now he bounces off. Um, so this is not a great rep, but it get, but his feet aren't bad, right? But he's too light. This kid's going to be a pretty good football player. They're both sophomores. He's about six foot four. His dad's six, eight. Um, this kid's going to be a good tight end. Uh, so this is the first time of him really learning how to do this. He was a receiver. And he's going to kind of skip into it. He moves his outside foot first, boom, hits it, shoves it across, and then transitions to the linebacker. So that's not bad. He's a very, very good athlete. Um, so, again, take it from kind of that. But here, here we are working on it uh, with a group. Now, what I did here was I took the boards. So whether you have a board or an agile bag or a towel or whatever it is, we want to stay on that side of it. We don't want to let him cross it. So I just kind of put it on an angle that he was angling to the man's hip or right inside his inside leg there. And so they're going to come through here, hit, shove. The shove is the important part. Take that extra step and shove and then transition like you're picking up a linebacker over the top. So here's a picture of that. Again, I think 72 is not bad. Boom. Get him over the top. That kind of gives you the idea of the drill. There's lots of different ways. So then you kind of take it to the next part where you're going to put, put it together with somebody else. So I didn't have all the film because we didn't have all these great filmers that everyone else has. Here's LSU uh, doing it with their tight ends. But he's just working a drill here. This is kind of a low to no contact, but he's just working his footwork to transition. So it's a good way to kind of get them working on transitioning, shoving, and finding the linebacker. So an easy way to do it, simple drills. And then here's, uh, here's Washington kind of putting it together with a big bag and creating more boom force than work up. I like the way that the center is going to do it here. Um, he's going to gallop over. Again, lead, bang, stay square, get up to the next level, find your linebacker. Um, transition into doing it in a, in a game. 
this kid was, was uh, you know, n- terrible in the weight room. Uh, really good kid, terrible in the weight room. But he, he, he really tried to get this technique down. And it's pretty good. So you can kind of see how the double team works here. He's not going to move very much. I don't get hung up, and we can talk double teams all day long. I don't get hung up with A-gaps unless there's someone standing in the A-gap, and then it cha- turns into a double down block. But if he's here, I just want him to take a four-step drive, put four feet in the ground, and then make contact. Um, that's essentially just to kind of keep him there and to hold point. What I've found more often than not is that, you know, uh, the defensive lineman cannot resist the offensive lineman. He is going to – that three technique is going to squeeze down to that guard no matter what, which kind of helps get him into our strike zone, and we're going to grab him. We're going to try to drive block that guy with everything we got as a guard, and then we let the, the high leg take over. But watch this kid. I mean, this is pretty good technique, and he, he gets the shove. Um, it does it. They're looking for the backside linebacker. They're looking for 45 there. He lifts him up, and he just stays on the block, but his eyes are on the linebacker. And we just tell him, you stay on the block till the linebacker gets nose-to-nose with you, then you either drive him back or you, or you you him out, and that's a whole other conversation. Um, again, here's, here's a good one. Here's the guard executing it with the center. So the center's going to drive the nose. The, the guard's going to come down and shove him over. We both have our eyes on this linebacker. If the linebacker steps up, he's going to continue the block. If the linebacker flows over, he's going to shove – and transition to block number nine. Uh, Number nine steps up here, so AJ shoves him over to the center, and they try to just make a mess in that A-gap. So you can see he's kind of jumping into it, you know, shuffle, shuffle, shoves him across, seals him down, gives us a good spot, safety's got to make the play. Um, if, If they move, right, when linemen move, or if there's an open gap, we stay in the high leg. We don't run through open gaps. We stay in the high leg and we actually tell our guys if there's a, if I'm a tackle and there's a two eye and we just think the guard's going to take him, we actually try to create a, we call it a a secret double team on the nose guard, like on the two eye, like the tackle's taking his path with a high leg just in case, and then he'll transition the linebacker. So here's, here's an example where uh, the defensive lineman here, 93 moves, our tackle stays on his path with a high leg and and it's able to find his linebacker. So again, it's 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 staying with the techniques, and they're simple, but I really feel that they're they're totally essential. Here's here's another one with a this is Auburn. Um, transitions the guy moves, and it's the same thing. So you can see it at the highest level of football, and at lower levels of football, or that might be actually uh, UCF. Um, it's all the same thing. Um, so that's Mike. That's what I had for. Like those run block non-negotiable things that I think are really key to teaching offensive linemen, and they, they fit into our offense really well. Um, but I am, I am, uh, I'll stop sharing here, and we can ask any questions we want. Or I hope that kind of did the trick. I was, I could go forever. So uh, that was good, man. I know uh, Coach Lip had a question. Coach Lip, you want to come on and ask? Less than one percent of injuries are serious effects. All right, let's see here. So Coach Lip said, is that tackle only doing that when he has help coming from the inside? Is there a difference between the guard is covered, uncovered? Yeah, so that's kind of what I was getting to uh, at, the, at the end. Is that, is that with uh, – oh, that's on the reach, Coach, right? Coach Lip, if you want to go uh, – uh, I'm going to – I'm just going to unmute, Coach. Or, Coach, you can un- unmute yourself. Yeah, I got him. Coach, right, coach. What, what was your question on the reach? <laughs> we lose him. I think I know what you're saying. Like, yeah, is is if if he doesn't have any help, is he still doing it? Um, I think it's more like when they do have help. Although, um, you know, when I when I tell him that uh, he's got no help, um, I'll tell him to kind of slow it down a little bit. But in general. We're just going. I think more often than not, we see enough movement that I'll tell the guys on the reach block stuff because we're really trying to get outside to compress the splits down and run it like elephants on parade. So, you know, I want I want the I kind of try to teach the overall play as like the point man is really kind of executing that technique, and then everybody else is running for the hip of the adjacent lineman. Does that make any sense? Um, you know, so if I was – even if I'm covered, I'm just running so that we're covering up all those gaps so people can't bust our gaps. So it's, it's truly more like elephants on parade of everybody linking together 
um, on our outside stuff because it's definitively going outside. Oh, there he is. So, Coach, does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. I, I, we haven't really brought a lot of outside zone, but um, we're, we're thinking about it this year and just trying to figure out, like, you know, that combination. Is, if, if I'm, like, overextended and that guy can he shoot, you know, inside me if the guard's yeah. not, you know, in, in the right position? If the guard's not coming with me, yeah. So, to me, like, even if the guard had a three technique on him, I would tell the guard, you're trying to get to the tackle and tell the center you're trying to get to the three. Okay, yeah. And then, so you know what I mean? Like, to me, it's like we're just trying to link up. And, right. and we're going to run it. I, I always say, like, like if, you're, if you're blocking it with no tight end and the tackle's the – I said the tackle's the point. So we're going to run to the – we're running – he's setting the point. So if the tackle's reaching out there, bang, sticking that guy in his chest, yeah. I've got a guard coming. And the guard's not worried about the man. The guard's worried about i got to get to my tackle's hip. So I want the guard kind of arcing and taking his play side hand and trying to get it onto the, the, the back of the tackle a little bit. And I want yeah. the center to get over there. I want everybody to yeah. get over there. Sure. Sometimes on the backside, Coach, though, um, we'll use the skip technique on the backside uh, to catch up a little bit because it's, it's faster. It's right. harder to do it on the front side because you get your feet crossed up. Um, but the other part about that was, like, if the guard takes the step and the defensive end rocks inside the tackle – Right. We tell the guard, hit him as hard as you can. Don't reach him. Don't do it. Just hit him as hard as you can. And that usually is enough based on where you're at. Um, so we're, we're looking, like the guard's looking for that guy. Even if he's got a three, he's kind of looking wide. Right. And you run out the ball because it's going outside. Yeah. You know, and that's how I ended up, like, when I was at Endicott, when I first got there, we were running a ton of jet sweep, right? That's all we ran. It was the only play we could run because you didn't really have to block anybody. <laughs> So, so I would just tell the guys, like, if I could get my center guard and tackle all reaching to the edge, and we, we took care of the edge, the speed of the play took care of everything from the, from the B-gap back. Now, when you're running it with the gun, it's a little bit slower. You need the backside guard in there. But the, but the principle remains the same, you know, that, that we're using our speed to get to the outside. We're looking a little bit at, at doing a little bit more of kind of like almost like a rocket where we're going to get the guy almost push motion and just push it out to him fast. Um, it's just is a there a look that gives you a look that gives you trouble, like a like a three three stack with that four I. Like, does that get a little bit you know convoluted or no? I mean, I, I'll I'll always say this: like, if we're going to talk about outside zone, I would say we're going to zone it until we can't, and then we'll tag it. So what I would say is like, oh, you know, the the guys, the the three technique is really wide. There's a four I. What do we do? I'm like, tell the tackle to block down, pull the guard. Let's bring a tight end in. Like, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna get to a surface that fits us with the defense we're playing. Like having to play against Kempe with like all the stuff that Bates did, like right. they gave you fits because they're going B gap, they're going out here, they're going there. You never knew where they were. They're in a bare front now. Like just going, hey, compress the splits, everybody reach. And if you can teach the jet good enough and get to the edge or find a way to flip it out there fast, you just got to make one block. And right. just make sure nothing's flying through. And it, sometimes the guy's taking your guard takes a shot in the side, but you know, he's a guard, you know, whatever. <laughs> What are you teaching, like, whoever's got the ball, whether that's a running back, receiver, what's his aiming point? What's he looking for as a first read, secondary read? I would tell the guys, get three – we want our imaginary point for where we want the ball to be before you think about something is probably three yards outside the imaginary tight end. We want this thing wide. I'm not reading it. I, I am not a zone guy at all. Like, you know, the bang, bend, bounce, like, it confuses right. me. And I'm like, I want to know that – we're running the ball there, and then if some shit happens, I'll, I'll, I can fix it. But if it's kind of like, well, coach, I thought it was a bounce read. Uh, no, I thought it was a bend read. Well, to me, everything's a bang read, you know, until it's not. Right. And then, and then if we're running power and I tell you to stick it up in there and you bounce it out and you're on your own and you take a, take a loss, you can come over and explain to me why that happened. The other kid could go in like, we just <laughs> we have more success with guys figuring out, like, I'm going to run it hard downhill. I'm going to put a guard through the hole. You know, like we're going to run yeah. ISO, we're going to run power. And I, I, I think that for me, especially going back to high school football, that was really good for the team this year because they needed to understand something that was going to make them physical because they weren't as physical. Thanks, no I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Let's see, what do we got? Coach Goff? Let's see, do, do running uh, run man's own blockings? Um, this is, this is, this is why I, I, like, I was just saying it to, to coach lip. I believe in the gap stuff and the man stuff a little bit, because I think it gives you a defined way to run the football. I, I, 
I grew up in the eye formation, the wishbone, and the, and the wing tee. Those are the three things that I played in, right? And so I saw my college coach who, when he retired, had more wins than anyone else in Division Three in New England, run basically a wing tee offense. And, you know, it's – you can't argue with – I, I, I hate to say it, you cannot argue with the wing tee. You just can't. And so a lot of my ideas were kind of born of that, that I believe in double teams. I think two-on-one is better. But zone to me, the difference was – is that we used to run inside zone, and I had a back at Endicott that was awesome, Mike Lane. He was the best guy. He's a Maine State cop. So, you know, uh, he's up there keeping you guys safe from all sorts of stuff, moose and Skip Capone. Um, so, uh, you know, he was really good at reading it, you know, and, like, he was one of those guys that he could bang, he could bend, he could bounce, he'd make good decisions, he'd press the line, you know, like he'd do all the things you want a zone back to do. If Mike got hurt, when the next kid came in, he couldn't do it. It killed the play. And, and to me, the zone play, the inside zone play, is a very expensive play to me. It takes a lot of reps for the line to get it right, and then the back has to get it right too. So I was kind of like, ugh, you know, we're running it, and then Mike goes out, and I got to bring the other kid in. And, and like, he, he was a hammer. Like, you know, everything was a nail. He just – so I'm like, let's get him going downhill, downhill, downhill. And so – well, Mikey's really good at running downhill too. All right, take the inside zone and behind the shed and shoot it because we're never going to run it again. So it just became – it was so expensive to me. I, I, I lost faith in the play. And, and part of it probably is like I just – I feel I'm a much better coach when it comes to gap scheme than, I, than it is zone scheme. So it's probably something in my teaching is holding that, was holding that play back for us because there's somewhere in my heart I didn't really believe in it. Right. Um, and so, you know, I – I've kind of lived in the gap world and it's been good. And that's kind of how we got to it. Awesome. Um, how big is the playbook in the call sheet? Man, if I can get that thing down to this, my goal this year is I want it this big. I, I, I've had call sheets like this. Um, I, I worked for a guy, I worked for a guy in Illinois that kept every single play that we ran in a season on his call sheet. Plays that you would never run after week one were on his call sheet in week 10, which means it was like in two-point font, and he refused to put it on a bigger sheet of paper. He had eight and a half by 11 with this point font. My sheet was big and had fewer plays. But as I kind of, you know, you, you look at it this way, like I go, we've all got a cookbook, but at some point you got to make a menu, right? Cookbooks are like this. Menus are like that. At the best restaurants, they're really small, Right. And you can only cook with the ingredients that you have. So there's years where it's, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit bigger because maybe your quarterback understands a little bit more and you can expand it a little bit based on his brain. And there's years where it's like, shit, if we got to go with this kid, we're running four plays and we're going to be lucky if we get to that, you know? And, and so ours, is, ours last year, I was able to do more because my quarterback, he's going to go play at Salve next year. Um, I got a receiver with a bunch of power five offers that, you know, as a kid that can stretch the field, but the quarterback's younger brother was my slot. So they know how to throw to each other. And so we kind of figured it out and we ran at the end of the year, I think I was running like, like four pass plays and we could, we could adjust it really easily. But with him, I could probably have done a lot more. I, you know, we all have too much stuff. We all have right. way too much stuff, you know, and that's the thing about offense. Defensive guys will find ways to do less. Offensive guys will pick them up off the ground, turn them into offensive plays, and put it on their sheet. Gotcha. Thank you. What else? What else we got? Yeah, payback's a bitch. Ah! See, but you're, you're coronavirus, so you can't come get me yet. It's not corona, though. Sorry, brother. <laughs> hey, great job. Coach, how much do you do with – you're talking about the, your, your, those five drills I think are awesome – what do you do initially with your, with your footwork? With the footwork? Well, I'll, yeah. Skip, I'll bird dog, you know, like old school, like get them in a grid. Can you tell those guys that kid that started in the friggin' 80s, please? I call it the same thing. I don't know when it started. It was, it was just the bird dog because you, you step in your point. Right? You step in your point. Exactly. Right? So I, I'll do that with the guys and get, get their steps down a little bit. Um, you know, footwork is footwork is footwork. So. Um, I'll kind of step them through it or I'll just go, I'll go bag, I'll go boards on air, you know, and just get them in there. So that they're stepping correctly. And once I'm not going to progress too fast either, you know, we, 
we don't like to get there. Like pass protection is a little bit different for me. Like that, that's a weird one. Like I will, I almost want to get to one-on-one pass rush as fast as I possibly can. I'd almost like to throw a kid in there. He doesn't know what the hell he's doing and then work backwards and fix him. Yeah. Um, is like the one time that you want to do that. But run blocking is so much harder than pass blocking, in my opinion. The lion's share is going to get done there. Pass blocking, to me, it's like if they understand how to get to the spot, right, how to get to their spot, and then get in a fight, we'll, we're going to be okay. Get run over slowly, and we'll be all right. Um, you know, defensive linemen are, are not very imaginative. So, you know, none of them have more than one rush move at the end of the day. If you make them waste a rush move, they'll go to a bull rush, and then you can beat that. So like, I spend time on things like, how do you beat the bull? Because you're going to see that, number one. How do you beat the speed rush? I actually put them into a position. I have, like, I have drills where I put my guys in disadvantageous positions, like, you just got smoked. Because that's going to happen more often than they get a good set and get a good hit on a kid, right? They're going to get beat. So I have a drill for when they're beat on the outside, and I have a drill where they're getting beat, like the guy's about to cross their face. And I work the drill from there on how to beat that. Um, and then I, I, I work against the bull. Um, and we do a lot of push-pull. It's a great conditioner. I, may, I, I don't know, Skip, if you saw the thing that I made that time, the, the plastic yeah. little yeah. thing that you can go like this, right? Herb Hand's got the fancy one. It's made out of metal, and it adjusts and does the shit. And I was like, I went down to Home Depot, and for six bucks, I built one, right? Yeah. Um, do a lot of that with the guys with the push-pull. But I, I want to teach them how to – how to fix things when they, when it goes wrong. Cause that's going to happen more often than not for them. So once I teach them how to set and they understand how I want them to set, we get them into a lot of like fit up positions where it's like the guys off, off, uh, I call it the offside rush drill. Like you put the guy so that, Oh, he beat me to my point. Like, what do I do then? I take a kick and I bear claw, you know, Oh, he's, he's right here on my inside. He's going to cross my face. Well, get him to shoot across your face. Then how are we going to, you know, kind of drop our inside foot and clamp and get back in front. Once they do that, I think you have a lot easier time with them um, just with the basics of things. Cause you don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of guys either. Coach, did you run uh, jet sweep this year? We did. We did. It was a good play for us. Did you run it from the gun? Or did you run it on the center? We, d we did both actually, Mike. Um, I taught it initially under center because I don't think there is any faster play in football than the under center jet sweep run correctly. Right. Um, and that, that is a whole other clinic, right? I mean, I, I used to talk on that all the time when I, when I, early 2000s when I was at Endicott, cause it's all we ran. Um, and you know, getting under center and pivoting on the play side foot and getting your butt in the a gap and handing that thing off and snapping it late and all the fun stuff that goes along. And then you can run crisscross and counter crisscross is the greatest play in the history of football because it's jet sweep. It's like jet sweep and power, like hooked up on a Friday night and had a baby. You know, it's like, it's like the best play ever, right? It's all it is is power, right, with a double handoff. It's fantastic stuff. We – I thought we weren't going to be able to run it effectively from the gun, but our quarterback and his brother figured it out. And so he was my – the brother was my jet sweep guy. And we – the only way that I adjusted it with the gun was I still want the handoff to happen in the play side A gap. So – when we would send the motion, you got to snap it early so you don't miss, right? So we were snapping it on the tackle. If we're under center, we always snapped it on the guard. We still snapped it on the tackle, and I would have the quarterback catch and take a slide step and leave it out there. And, and the kid would go flying through there and get it, and it was, it was a good play for us. We scored probably like six or seven touchdowns on it. And you just reach it out up front? Just reach everything. Reach everything. I get the back out there too. We get everybody going. You know, it, it is student body to the field. You know, the that's the thing. High school field. Holy shit! Like coming down from college, I'm like, there's a lot more room out there. You know, so like, hey, let's run that. Let's run that over there. And as long as you can get it past the edge, and and the sweeper understands, you got to start making yards when you can make yards. Like, don't just run that thing to nowhere. As soon as you can start getting upfield, get upfield. And and once they started kind of adjusting to that. Um, the depth of it's good because you're clearing the trash. Like when you're handing it off behind center, you got a belly back. I think when you're coming across with the uh, with the jet, it kind of naturally clears the trash at the edge. Um, and then you just get if I get I would double crack it. I I'd light guys up and then send my send my back out. And he's 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 checking every block. He checks the tackle. He checks the next block. He gets out there to the corner who doesn't want to tackle anybody anyway. Exactly. Then you can run passes off of it and all kinds of crazy shit. And your playbook gets like this. Your sheet's like, 
No, no. You know, you got like what a like a nun. Good thing is with my my play sheet coach, I can't see very well, so it had to be big font. Only had so much room. I'm good. Those are the best ones. Those are the best ones. You get to the end. Like I would get to the end when things on on the call sheet, and I would go in and I'd like check off like what I was running. And you'd look at it and you're like, I we we wasted a lot of time this week. We wasted a lot of time this week. I think I think having a few plays that you know the answers to, you know, and then don't be afraid to throw the don't be afraid to to, to be aggressive. I think that's the other thing that I learned a lot this year. Like I think when I was at Bowdoin, because we were struggling and it was getting it was hard and you had a lot of people in your ear and there's all these expectations that um, that we really couldn't meet. Um, we were, we're nervous. We're nervous to make calls, you know, and, and like, we've all got a couple of good players. I, this year, I kind of got, I was saying it to Coach Vile, like, he said he was much more aggressive making calls at UNE than he was at Bowdoin, just because he, he was like, I go, I go, I know, I got into, I don't give a shit mode either. Like, I'm going to throw the ball down the field. Like, I'm going to take some shots. So, like, I really like Coach Lip's talk on vertical passing game, because I dig the vertical passing game. All that stuff that you're doing, Lip, is the stuff that we were doing, just like, Teach them how to throw the four verts and then do all the changes off of it. And it's really hard to defend. Oh, they're in two backs. They're not going to go four verts. And the guy's out the backfield up to shoot, you know, and the play action stuff off of it is fantastic. But you got to take shots. Like, let the kids go play. Because that's the, that's the thing that's going to save the game for all of us is that it's fun again. You know, football wasn't any free. We thought it was fun back in the 80s. It wasn't fun. You know, it was, you know, you're getting the shit kicked out of you every day. That, and the coaches told you it was fun and you believed them because no one asked why. Yeah, I needed now that extra. I think, get aggressive. I was the opposite this year. The What's that? I was, uh, we got really conservative this year for the first time in like my life, and so probably cost us. So I needed that lecture. I got to get back throwing the ball down the field and the I don't give a shit mode. I like that. I'm gonna steal that because that's what I'm. I'm at my best and we're at our best. But I'm like that. I get conservative and I'm trying to protect the lead and punt the ball and play good defense. That's not how yeah. I'm wired. We've had some success, but not like the ultimate success, and that's on me. I think. Lip, I got away from it so much. I was, I was onside kicking or pop kicking every kick, right? Because I'm not going to kick the thing back to a guy. I'll talk about that, Mike, later on in the week. I'll talk yeah, to we you. Got Wednesday on that, I think. Right? Scorched earth. It is scorched earth mentality. Go after – don't even teach a punt return. Don't even teach a punt return. Teach them how to block punts, and you won't block as many as you want, or maybe at any, but you'll scare some people a couple times. You got you to be willing to take a penalty or three, right? But, <laughs> you know, go after punts. Um, you know, uh, pop kick, onside kick, get the ball on the ground, go, go have a chance to change, change get the ball back. Um, you know, punting, right? I, I've, I've even changed kind of how my thoughts on punting, unless we're really backed up. You know, if, if I get about midfield, you know, my defensive coordinator knows I'm going to go for it. I'm going to play four downs. Like, I'm just going to change my four, like my four down area changed. It got pushed back for the first time onto my side of the 50, where I was just like, screw it, we're going for it. And we'll live with it because, oh, they scored on us fast. We get the ball back. We'll go back down again. We'll find a way to score. Like, and who gives a shit? And the kids love it because they think, like, everything that we're doing is, like, crazy. They're like, we're going for it on fourth down. Like, every kid in America, look, we've all been in this situation, right? And Skip will get this because O-line guy, right? Has the offensive line ever said, no, we shouldn't go for it? <laughs> no, coach, let's go get it. We're getting our fucking asses handed to us, and you guys want to go for it on fourth and five, you know, because, oh, I got the guy now. What about the 90 other plays that you missed them, right? But they'll, they'll all get into going for it. Um, you know, if you have a, like, I'm, I'm getting into, like, this offensive formation punt stuff that I'm working because I think my, my, my quarterbacks can punt a little bit. So you know, we'll back them up a little bit, protect the center, and be able to punt, or we can walk it up and get the ball and run an offensive play. So Is that from a guy from Vermont high school doing that? Um, I, I got it from, I got it from a guy out in Minnesota, to be honest with you, but, okay. um, is it Rico Lercio? Is that his name? Uh, I don't know. So. guy. Yeah. We, anyway, he we, had some fourth and go offense where he uh, put the quarterback at about eight and he rolled out and he, yeah, you can do all routes. kinds of stuff. It was crazy. We, we, we did it when I was at the university of Chicago, we did it as a, like, that was kind of our mid zone area of if we're going to go for it or not. Yeah. And it was, it was ba it was a punt formation, but we had our quarterback as the personal protector. And, and, you know, he would kind of look and make the call and all that other <laughs> stuff. And, um, yeah. and it was good, but, but I'm, I'm saying like, almost like, uh, almost like when, when we, you would quick kick, you know, and quarterback catches it and boots it and there's nobody back there, you know, that right. kind of an idea. Um, but, you know, Kenny, 
like I got some kids that are pretty good athletes. Someone's got to be able to rugby kick the friggin' thing. Like I, I, I got a kid that's, I got a running back that's six foot, six foot one, 230 pounds. You know, he's, he's got no fat on him. He's going to go to probably play in the Ivy league or in the SCAG. He's smart as hell. Like, I'm like, can I just, Sam, why can't I just snap it to you? You run over there and kick it. And if there's nobody there, run and get a first down. Like, why does it have to be, why does football have to be so hard? It doesn't. Let's don't give a shit. Just like let it all hang out. Cause that's all the kids want to do. And if it gets you one more player, we win. You know, I got, I got kids right. now that haven't played football here at Kingswood Oxford that are now coming to me saying, I want to play because they saw guys having fun. And, you know, Sometimes you got to take it down a notch because the the the, the coach deep down inside you that you that, that where you want to kill everybody you know you got to kind of bury that guy a little bit you know like you, you can't be like that and um, you know I'm finally at a point where like I I'm uh, I've got gray hair uh, I have to take pills that I don't want to take so I feel like I can be one of the old guys now right is that I've evolved like our practices are shorter you know we we do more stuff with the guys that is efficient. Um, you know, we answer questions. My high school coach, his answer to everything was like to kick you. So <laughs> I answer questions, you know, and you, you find out the kids that really love it. And I, I, we had a kid this year, this is, this is a good story. Uh, we had a kid this year, um, come out to our seven on seven. He's just watching seven on seven, six foot black kid, good looking athlete. Right. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? So like, oh, he played football like four years, three years ago, or whatever, eighth grade or something while he was here. And he goes, he hasn't played since. So I introduced myself to the kid and I told him, I said, come out for the first day of football. And if you hate it, I'll never bother you again. And he said, okay, I'll do that. And I said, now, if you don't show up, I'm going to call you a liar every day of your life here. So I'll harass you to death. So just letting you know, you need to show up. Well, he didn't show up. So I saw him, he was with all his boys and I guilted him. I hit him hard. Um... And uh, he said, no, 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 I'm coming out. And he went and got equipment. And he came out, had a smile on his face from the first moment he came out. And he's a really good football player. About game four, he says, coach, do you think I can be a college football player? I said, someone will, someone will take you because he's a great athlete. He's going to go play at Hobart. You know what I mean? Like the kid's a college football player thinking he's going to just go shoot three-pointers. You know, he's one of these, I'm a one-sport guy. Comes out for football for one season. He's going on to play college football. So I think that's gotten in the ears of a few guys that they're like, Maybe we should be doing more than that, which at a small school like us and a lot of small schools, if you don't have your best players playing two, three sports, you're dead. You know? Welcome to Maine High School football. That's what we do. We walk the hallways and every kid that's over 200 pounds, I'm like, why are you not a guard for us? I don't get my, it. My, son, my son's playing for us under, under, uh, under duress, under, uh, you know, he doesn't want to. Um, <laughs> I think he would rather be like – film and help me chart plays like he digs that stuff but I'm like you got to play because I need a body right <laughs> um and uh so he's playing he's not loving it but he's playing I, I think he'll grow into it he's he's tall um but he's a shitty football player right now um but you know the the kids that we got here um are there's some really good athletes walking around here that are playing one sport we got kids how about this this is the crazy thing about about uh Here's, here, okay, so communism fell and left its sport, right? So soccer. So, <laughs> so we've got these academies. I don't know if – I've never heard of this up in Maine, but we have these academies. There's this academy, Oakwood Academy Soccer. If you play for Oakwood Academy, you're not allowed to play for your high school team. So your parents pay $5,000 for you to be part of this soccer club. And the soccer club says you're not allowed to play for your team. It's probably year round as well. And it's year round. Yeah. And there's, 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 there's division one kids, division one soccer kids that could help our team win games and probably take us to the next level are not allowed to play for us because the parents play for. And then here's the other thing, friggin' hockey. I love hockey kids. 